Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today for Addiction and COVID-19, a conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Nora Volkoff. My name is Jessica Holsey, and I'm the founder of Addiction Policy Forum. Addiction Policy Forum is a patient advocacy organization that works nationwide to help patients and families to translate the science um, and works to end the stigma around addiction. We are so grateful to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Volkoff for joining us today. Um, as you know, people with substance use disorder are advised to take extra precautions during the pandemic, and maybe more, more vulnerable to the coronavirus. And we also know that the stress and isolation of the pandemic um, have had a tremendous impact on our community. Uh, we are so grateful to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Volkoff um, who joined us today um, to have a discussion about this intersection and really how we can um, keep our population safe. So at that, first off, Dr. Fauci, thank you again for joining us and also your efforts to ensure care for all vulnerable populations. Um, we're grateful to you for your leadership. Thank you very much, good to be with you. So do you want me to say a couple of words? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so uh, I think it's really important to get to the questions, but let, just to remind the audience that we are really truly living through a, a unprecedented historic uh, period now with the, a pandemic whose impact uh, is really, uh, has not seen anything like it for the last 102 years since the, 2000, the 1918 influenza pandemic. We have had a bunch, about three and now hopefully not four surges in um, um, infections and cases in our country. Right now, the toll I think we need to remind people of who now somewhat get a little bit numbed by the numbers, we've had over 535,000 deaths in this country. Uh, there was a period when we were having between three and 400,000 cases per day and three to 4,000 deaths per day. Currently, we're in a very critical period, truly a crossroads, in that we had a peak, the worst peak we had of the entire pandemic that was over the months of November, December, and early January. That has now decreased in a sharp decline. But the reason I say we're at a crossroads is that over the last couple of weeks to three weeks, we've had a plateauing of the diminution where we had a sharp decrement in cases, and now we are sort of stuck at around 53,000 cases per day, which is really very risky because whenever we've seen that plateau, then we often have another surge the way they're having in Europe. So before we even get on with the questions, I just want to make a plea to everyone that now is not the time to relax our public health measures of mask wearing, keeping physical distance and avoiding congregate settings because there really is a risk. The light at the end of the tunnel is the vaccines. We now have vaccines that will be soon available to everyone and anyone by the end of May would have enough vaccines available by then. And by the 1st of May, anyone can get a vaccine regardless of what priority risk there are. So there's some very good news, but there's also a big challenge ahead. Anyway, I'll stop there and Happy to answer questions later. Great, thank you. Um, we've had questions submitted from our network of patients, families, providers, practitioners, and also state and local government um, officials. Um, and so the first question we have is for those who are receiving medications for addiction treatment, MAT, does that present a risk, a safety risk for receiving a COVID-19 vaccination? You know, the answer to that is no, it is not a safety risk. If a person, because of uh, whatever substance abuse they happen to be involved with, have a suppression of their immune response, it is conceivable that they may not have as robust a response to the vaccine. But since this is not a live attenuated vaccine, they are three now that have been approved for EUA, two are mRNA vaccines. One is a non-replication competent human adenovirus vector, the J&J. &J. The short answer to the questions, there is not a safety issue, but there may be an issue of a robust response may not be as good as in someone who has no other element of a medical history. Okay. And then uh, regarding the durability of the vaccines, what is the current knowledge of how long protection might last? You know, we don't know the answer to that. 
but it's at least six months moving on eight months because that's how long we've been following people from the beginning of the first trials that we had. That brings up the question of why we are following people so carefully for durability, since we do not know what the duration of a coronavirus specific response is. If it diminishes over time, that's one of the reasons why we have as part of our consideration that we might have to actually boost people after a certain period of time. Okay. Um, another question that came in is, my daughter is being released from a minimum security prison next week. She is 28 years old and did not get vaccinated. She has a history of chronic opioid misuse and she will be entering a post-incarceration program. Why are our at-risk populations categorized by age and not risk? You know, the, in some respects, they are categorized <clears throat> by risk. For example, in the 1C group are individuals of any age 16 to 64 who have an underlying condition. I think the point that you're making is a good one that a lot of um, medical providers would like to see those with an underlying condition be pushed up further in the priority risk, which I think might be a good idea. Thank you. Um, in light, another question that came in is, in light of the mistrust in government run programs by the black and brown communities, as validated historically in response to the COVID-19 vaccine efforts in this country, how do we work to establish trust in those communities, a trust that would in, the, in those treatment and recovery efforts that would level the playing, playing field as it were? Well, one of the things that we've learned that you have to do right off the bat when you're dealing with the brown and black community, you need to respect their hesitancy and not just blow it off as if there's no reason because their hesitancy is really grounded in a terrible history that the federal government in its medical programs decades and decades ago imposed upon African-Americans dating back to the shameful experiments of Tuskegee. Even though most of the brown and black people who would be vaccinated now were not even born at the time of Tuskegee, that has been handed down generation to generation. So there is a distrust there that we have to respect. Once we get past that and say, we understand why you have a hesitancy, then we've got to find out what are the two or three reasons why they do have hesitancy over and above beyond the inherent distrust of the government. And it's usually related to two things. One that the vaccine development went so quick that they suspect that there were corners that were cut and safety was sacrificed. And we have to impress upon them that the speed with which we went is the reflection of decades of scientific research and investment in the research that went into the platform technology as well as the imaging design. And then the next question is, how do we really know it's safe and effective? they often don't fully appreciate that those decisions are made by an independent data and safety monitoring board that looks at the data and makes recommendations in an independent and transparent way. So those are the two or three ways that we address hesitancy, particularly in minority populations. Thank you so much. Such an important thing for us to ensure that we're doing so that we're vaccinating and taking care of all of our population. Um, another question that was submitted, if I am vaccinated, but my partner is not, what kind of activities can I do? Can I expand my bubble? Am I putting my partner at risk by seeing other vaccinated and or non-vaccinated people? Well, currently the CDC has just updated their guidelines as to what vaccinated people can do. And in the next weeks to months, they will be expanding that. The fundamental core of what a vaccinated person can do is that in the, in the context of a home and not a public place, but the home, you can have two vaccinated people or three or four or five vaccinated people together without wearing a mask. And you can not worry about physical contact and physical distancing. You can include 
a non-vaccinated person in that group, so long as the non-vaccinated person doesn't have an underlying condition that if they did get infected, they would have a higher incidence and likelihood of having a severe outcome. The typical example that you give is a grandma gets vaccinated. They want to visit their daughter and their granddaughter who are unvaccinated. Is that allowed? And the answer is, as long as the daughter and the granddaughter are healthy and don't have an underlying condition, it is permissible to visit, not wear a mask, and have physical contact. All right, that's very helpful, thank you. Another question that came in from our network is looking back on history, how does a pandemic affect mental health long-term? Well, I think that's one of the most serious issues that we're facing, we are facing now. And I think even when this pandemic is under control, we are going to see a considerable amount of long range post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms in individuals. I think we tend to underestimate what it means to just completely uh, upend a person's life, uh, essentially cutting them off from interpersonal contact. I think among children, this is gonna be something that we're gonna see negative effects that we would not necessarily have predicted. So I'm quite frankly, very concerned about what the long-term mental health issues are gonna be following this pandemic. Yeah. We've seen um, that in our community too, individuals in treatment and in recovery from substance use disorder and the effects of isolation and not having access to their social, social network. So figuring out what we can do for, for everyone who's struggling, even as um, we're all vaccinated and come out of our homes is going to be a, a major priority. Uh, another question submitted, um, since many people who receive treatment for addiction do so in congregate care settings in which it is difficult to maintain social distancing and because of sometimes the transient nature of our population, um, is there one vaccine that is recommended such as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it's a single shot? You know, there is no single vaccine that is recommended one over the other. However, there are some considerations like the one I believe you're alluding to where um, the circumstances of people such as homeless people or people who are migrant workers who you may not get the opportunity to come back for a second visit that a single shot vaccine might be preferable. That's very helpful, thank you. Uh, another question, um, COVID-19 has made harm reduction such as naloxone distribution and clean supplies more difficult to access. Has there been any analysis on increase in overdoses and transmission of HIV and hepatitis during the pandemic? Well, certainly there has been increases in, in, in overdoses. I mean, the drug abuse problem, substance abuse problem is certainly um, accelerated and intensified at a time. We are seeing all aspects of that, overdoses, over substance abuse and suicides. No. Um, it's tragic to see the numbers, right? Sort of the head-on collision between right. the pandemic and another epidemic. Um, another question that came in is, uh, what has been learned by, by your organizations um, when developing your pandemic response that can now be applied to fighting the addiction epidemic? What can people on the front lines of the addiction epidemic expect as an enhancement and how soon can we implement those practices? Basically, have we learned anything from our response in this that we can translate onto how we're improving care for our substance use disorder community? You know, I think it's community involvement. I mean, we, we learned that with HIV very early on to involve the community at the local level. I think if you have a very top-down approach and you don't get community workers and people that are trusted uh, in the community, uh, we learn in every single challenge we have in a public health issue why that is important. And I think it's probably as or more, even more important when you're dealing with substance abuse community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a, another um, really thoughtful question submitted by someone on our network. Uh, I facilitate an online peer coach and support program for parents and partners who loved ones 
whose loved ones have struggled throughout the pandemic. For months, family members have tried to cope with their loved ones' illnesses and the swings of a week or two of sobri sobriety, followed by very destructive and dangerous binging. Several have been taken to hospital emergency rooms, unwilling or unable to get into treatment or find the support that they need to maintain recovery. Um, how can we serve these individuals moving forward? How will this experience change what we do in the future? You know, I mean, it, it's an obvious, uh, it's a question with an obvious answer is that this is really a major challenge when you put stress on the system right now. I mean, how best you can serve them is by just marshalling whatever resources you have and anticipate that this is going to happen. It's no surprise when you see the acceleration of issues that you've just alluded to. It's, it's entirely predictable given the stress on the system. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and I, I know we um, have a hard stop with you, but I have a, a few more questions I hope we can get through, including sure. this one. Uh, both addiction and COVID-19 um, disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minorities. What state and federal policies can help these disadvantaged populations who may not, may na may not always have access to care? Well, that is a question we deal with every day. The Biden administration, the president and vice president themselves have made it very clear that in everything we do now, equity is going to be and is an important issue. Let me give you an example regarding access to vaccines. Um, it is quite clear that if you don't particularly outreach to the minority communities, they will be under vaccinated. So what the administration has done is set up community vaccine centers, particularly located in areas that are demographically overrepresented by minority populations. Opening up the federally qualified healthcare community centers to also use that as a source of the vaccine administration. Third, to put into pharmacies doses of vaccine when pharmacies are located and again, areas that are demographically represented by minorities. And finally, to use mobile units to get into those areas that are classically underserved. And the final thing is to employ a lot of vaccinators that can go out into the community. We're using military, we're using retired physicians, nurses, and healthcare providers, and also We've established a task force that's called the Equity Task Force in the White House to actually address this problem. It really is one of the most important issues that the administration is addressing in this outbreak. Well, that's wonderful. Um, we'll keep tabs and updates and push that out to our network so they're aware of those access points that you're building. Dr. Fauci, um, uh, before you have to go, do you have any sort of final thoughts or imparting wisdom on our community? Um, again, we represent, you have patients and families, you have providers, healthcare providers, as well as government officials on the line today. Yeah, I, I, the message I, I tend to give when, when I get asked that question, particularly a community that is suffering under the stress and despair you know, despair is one of the things that really is the enemy of what we're trying to do. And when people feel a sense of despair that there's no end to this, they give in to things that might be very detrimental ultimately to their health and their well being. So, my message to the community and for those who are caring for them that this is going to end. There really is light at the end of the tunnel. We are vaccinating up to 3 million people a day. By the time we get to May, everyone will be eligible for vaccines. And by the end of May, there'll be enough vaccine to vaccinate everyone in the country. So we just want people to hang in there. Things are definitely going to get better. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. We really appreciate you taking time for us today and all of the, the work you're doing in your leadership, particularly in making sure that vulnerable populations are cared for, like individuals with substance use disorders. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Volkoff, um, we also have, um, uh, uh, it's been, it's a, 
an honor to have both of you on the line with us today. So we have our top doctor on addiction in America and our top doctor on infectious disease uh, diseases to really dive into this intersection and how we can protect our community. Um, uh, so Nora, thank you for uh, being here uh, for us and all that you do to take care of our population um, sort of daily. I'd love to open this up to you for just opening remarks um, and sort of comments in general about um, your focus on our population during the pandemic. Jessica, thanks very much for organizing this and for having me and for bringing Tony into the dialogue. I think it is extraordinarily important that we uh, accelerate and strengthen partnerships and collaborations. And to me, this is one of the things that have uh, that I have seen happen and I've heard by others report exactly the same situation. Whereas the terrible stress that we're all encountering uh, is making us vulnerable for adverse behaviors that can jeopardize our health. It's also facilitating collaborations. It's uh, bringing up the best in, in people to help each other. And I think that that's uh, extremely important in all fields, but particularly in the substance use disorder field. And as I was listening to, um, to Dr. Fauci, or Tony, as I usually call him, because he's, uh, he, I mean, he's our hero at the NIH also, but he, in, in terms of his responses, because he had uh, addressed the challenges that we had with the HIV and how they were solved, and he's now addressing the challenges on, that we're facing with COVID. And the responses that he gave were, in fact, very relevant for us in the substance abuse field, which is how important it is to bring the community together, to have the community actively engage in the solutions and including the, the uh, development of trust for the vaccination, which is, I would uh, highly, I mean, again, I highly, I cannot under underemphasize how extraordinarily important it is for all of us to get vaccinated. And in particular, I would sort of say any individuals with a substance use disorder, um, I, I've spoken about it, I've written about it, they are at increased risk of becoming infected. And if they get infected, they are increased risk of uh, more adverse outcomes and death. So thereupon how important it is to do very, very proactive in bringing the um, the trust that individuals with substance use disorders and their families need in order to get the vaccine. I do want to highlight that. I also want to highlight the notion that in no way does the vaccine interfere with the treatment of substance use disorder. And this becomes extremely important because we're living in an era where having a problem with addiction, whether it is opioids or stimulants, is, has a very high mortality rate because of the type of drugs that are available and the inability to know what someone is going to be injecting. So being, being relying on the, the misuse of these substances puts an extremely high risk of mortality and, and thereupon the importance of highlighting uh, the need for treatment. So I, those are two things that I want to actually highlight. And the third one, which is the one that also you asked the question, what is very relevant for all of us working in the substance abuse field is that of social belonging, of being part of a community that values us. I think that's probably one of the most powerful reinforcers that we have that can strengthen and help someone achieve recovery and without which any one of us becomes vulnerable for substance use disorder. Uh, no one is immune. I mean, it's, it's again, we need to be part of a collective and we need to be part in a way that we feel cared by that collective and that we are valued by that collective. And unfortunately with COVID, of course, we have had social isolations and distancing that in many instances, of course, has um, made us lose our reinforcers. But also a very unfortunate component is many people have lost loved ones. And that loss is something that lingers in, in our lives and it is very, is very hard to to actually address and i think that's probably one of the strongest stressors that we we all are facing and and when tony was speaking about the post-traumatic stress that uh, is left behind after we control the covid pandemic one of them would be the the loss of lives and the loss of loved people as well of course as the loss of jobs and the difficulties in the economy and the loss of 
community centers and facilities that uh, allowed us to keep in touch. So that's what I, I would just want to be all of us aware that we need to be proactive and to realize this is what is going to happen after we all get vaccinated and not to be have a magical thinking but to be proactive in ways that we can buffer those, those challenges. Oh, thank you, Nora. Um, you know, when you uh, speak about the, the importance of getting vaccinated and also the vulnerabilities um, for those that, that struggle with an addiction, that have a substance use disorder, uh, a, a couple sort of questions, if you could um, sort of uh, explain a little bit in more detail and sort of in layman's terms for, for all of our, our patients and families in our network. Um, it, it's sort of easy to understand why individuals who are addicted to or have a substance use disorder with uh, marijuana or even nicotine because it affects your lungs and we know that that could be a vulnerability. Can you explain a little bit why um, opioid use or methamphetamine use or alcohol use, um, we talk about sort of the uh, uh, effects on the heart, but why that might be a vulnerability for COVID-19 as well? Yeah, no, it's, it's um, both, both of these drugs, I mean, and, and the same thing with, with cocaine. Cocaine, let me, let me tackle first cocaine and methamphetamine. These are drugs that we, we term stimulants because they activate, um, they stimulate the sympathetic system, which is the system that basically activates our heart, our lung, the circulation. But when you take methamphetamine or cocaine, um, there is a supraphysiological stimulation with these organs. And that can result in fatal cardiac arrhythmias it can result in blood vessel vasoconstriction, which is blood vessels decrease their diameter. So you cannot deliver blood to the tissue, can result in myocardial infarction or a stroke in your brain. And these drugs also can, um, I mean, because of the effects on blood vessels, damage pulmonary function. So here we have the main organs affected by COVID, lung, heart, blood vessels directly and negatively impacted by um, stimulant drugs, both acutely as well as someone that has been using them chronically, they will have more damage to these organs. With respect to opioids, the effects are slightly different. Uh, one of the reasons why people die when they consume opioids at higher doses or, or they consume, consume it um, in combination with other drugs is because you actually are inhibiting uh, the respiration centers of the brain. So you stop breathing, literally, you stop breathing. And, and that's not something what, that we think about. I mean, I breathe automatically, we all breathe automatically. And if our breathing goes down, we don't necessarily notice it. And if it goes down below a certain level, we're going to lose consciousness. So we are not going to be aware of it. What happens when the breathing goes down is that there's less oxygen to be delivered into the lungs. And, and then that makes you vulnerable, ultimately, that, that can cause uh, uh, an arrhythmia, and that's why you die. Well, if you put that in terms of chronic exposures, it's going to make your whole pulmonary system much more sensitive to inflammation, which makes it more sensitive to getting infected with COVID. And if you are taking drugs when you get infected, that's going to increase the risk that you have a really adverse effect because you are not already oxygenating properly, that COVID virus is going into your lungs and interfere with the permeability of oxygen. And that combination is just fatal. And on top of this, both stimulants and opioids negatively impact the immune function. So your own white blood cells that normally are there as your army to get rid of vaccines or, or vaccines or viruses or, or bacteria, are not functioning properly. And that's why people that are taking these drugs have higher risk of infections. And with alcohol, the story is like, uh, it basically is targeted towards alcohol is also very, very damaging to the immune function, the immune system. And it promotes pro-inflammatory states. And as we know, one of the reasons we, for, that associated with mortality with COVID is a very intense inflammatory response. So this is whereupon we actually come to understand why individuals with a substance use disorder are at greater risk of both the infection and the adverse outcomes from COVID. Well, thank you for, for breaking that down for us, uh, Dr. Volkoff. I really appreciate it. We have many questions that have been submitted from our, our network and our viewers. Um, one question here, uh, stress on families during COVID has put people on the fringe of SUD 
over the edge into active addiction? How is the medical community preparing for the co consequences of this? And I'm glad that question com, uh, is coming up because it basically means people are thinking about it. And in my introduction, I, I made up that point because it's actually something that we need to plan ahead of time and start acting right now. And, and I, I've said it many times, I understand the urgency of addressing the current COVID pandemic, but we need to learn to multitask because at the same time, we're having this opioid crisis that now it's merging into stimulant crisis. And we're also seeing an increase in the use of other substances. So we need to recognize this as a challenge because if we do not address these complex downstream effects from the stressors, we are jeopardizing actually the whole COVID response, but we're also jeopardizing the next step in what is called the after times of COVID. I want to speak about the after times of COVID for our recovery, our recovery as a society. So we need to start now to strengthen the prevention efforts and at the same time, plan ahead to ensure that when everybody's vaccinated, when the cases are controlled, that we will be in a place where prevention will protect all of those individuals that were placed at higher risk, whichever level of their trajectory they were because of the COVID pandemic. And that will require, first of all, partnership across agencies, across community groups. It will require the involvement of all of us, all in, us in government agencies, all scientists, patient groups like yours, patient families. All of us need to work together to come up with a strategy. And it will require resources. I mean, that's an, another element that we need to be able to communicate why this is so important so that then the resources can be provided to facilitate the um, introduction of strategies, prevention strategies. Oh, thank you. Uh, another question we had uh, submitted. I work for a residential uh, substance use disorder and mental health provider in Maryland. How can we better serve our patients when they have already received their fac first vaccine uh, dose before admitting with us. We have found that it is pretty impossible and an, an impossible decision for both the patient and their families to make, seek treatment now or wait until the next dose and risk losing the motiv motivation for treatment. Go for treatment right now, don't delay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was thinking about it just in terms of to immediately it comes to me for, for some of the conditions that we're seeing an increase, for example, in mortality associated with cancer because people are not taking care of medical situations because of the fear of contagion. And in the process, they are putting themselves at much greater risk by not paying attention. And I highlight uh, right now, uh, the drugs that are out there in the black market are extremely dangerous. We've never been in a situation where the drugs that are being sold uh, are so dangerous as it relates to the risk of overdoses and mortality. So I highlight that. I mean, even if you do have only one vaccination, that's not the reason to not seek treatment right now. And we know that even the first vaccination provides um, protection against severe infection. So even though it's not 100% protecting you against getting infected, it appears to have a pretty good effect to prevent against severe infections that result in hospitalization. So it's straightforward. I mean, my, my strong recommendation would be get treatment for your substance use disorder. Do not delay it. Okay, now let's, thank you, Nora. Thank you so much. Another question we have, uh, can we share with the public how stigma keeps people from seeking help? and? that holding stigma against people for having a disease or a substance use disorder is extremely harmful? Yeah, and I, I mean, it's very well said in the question. I mean, stigma is extremely uh, harmful. I mean, we're trying to, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get people to go get treatment for their substance use disorder. We're trying to get people that have a substance use disorder to go vaccinate themselves. But if they feel stigmatized and they feel discriminated, no, no one likes to be discriminated. So they are not wanting to go to get uh, into a healthcare system or get uh, involved with it because they've been discriminated in the past. And we cannot continue like that. I mean, the, the solution that we have both as it relates to the opioid crisis and the pan pandemic is to engage people in treatment 
and to retain them in treatment. And that requires that we have respect for the other, that we don't stigmatize and that we don't mistreat individuals. It's probably, I, and, and in looking at it from the perspective of how we are all learning new things, I mean, the COVID pandemic, I think it's making us reflect in our own self because we see ourselves in isolation and, and how we are responding that um, we need to actually be much more sensitive to the unique realities of each individual. And that if we do not respect that, they are going to actually um, get away from us. And so, so if we want to bring them into treatment, we have to treat them as we, I mean, I've been said a thousand times, a golden rule, to be treating them as we would like to be treated ourselves. Why can't we not do that? I mean, why do we keep on these prejudices of someone is taking drugs because they have moral failure? I mean, we've been advancing decades and decades and decades of research to show that that is nonsense. And it's just perpetuating this distrust and stigmatization of people that are very vulnerable and that um, by uh, not bringing them in, we are jeopardizing their outcomes and the outcomes of their families and, and, and their friends. So that's why the word is sort of says, yes, stigma is extraordinarily harmful. And I think that COVID pandemic is making it clear how harmful and uh, untenable it is in many ways. We want to solve a problem. We need to get rid of stigma. Absolutely. Um, I, I uh, like you reinforcing the golden rule. We should treat our patients how we should be, if we want to be treated ourselves. We should print up some t-shirts with that on it. Um, another question that came in, do you have any insight on the telehealth regulations that have been relaxed during the public health emergency relative, relative to addiction treatment? Specifically, what are your thoughts um, about whether or not they will be made permanent? For example, the um, ability to prescribe buprenorphine without having to conduct an in-person exam first. Well, I, I smile because I would like them. I mean, it's ultimately has been a godsend. Um, they've been able to buffer what would have been devastating in, in terms of our ability to put people on treatment and to keep them on treatment, as well as provide them with uh, the um, treatment for comorbid conditions that in the past was not available. And it would have exacerbated already the health disparities that we see. Uh, so telehealth has changed that. It has brought into the communities in a more equitable way, not 100% equitable, but in a more equitable way access to treatment that it has allowed uh, for patients to be able to receive buprenorphine um, prescribed through um, a telehealth provider. And, and again, without it, the mortality would have been much worse than what we're already seeing with a COVID pandemic. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but um, it is actually gives, um, expands our capacity to provide with treatment for individuals that need it. And so what we are doing at NIDA is uh, we're supplementing researchers so that they can obtain information that can then be utilized to understand how efficacious telehealth has been, how do these policies have improved the treatment outcomes on patients. And with that data, then we hope that it can be utilized to make it a permanent change. Um, so it's not that it will stay after we control the COVID pandemic. It's not just a temporary modification. And, it, and also we want to learn from these experiments, from these experiences, what works the best? What are gaps that exist? And for example, we already know that one of the gaps has been that not everybody has access to the web. And as a result of that, not everybody can have access to telehealth. And, 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 and so therefore, to me, certainly uh, uh, what had crystallized as, as something that I think as a nation we need to tackle, which I already was very interested as, as something that we as Americans should aim for, is to provide access to the web to everybody. Because without that web access, the health disparities are going to actually continue to grow. Uh, we should be able to give everybody all of the advantages that now come through the web. Telehealth, education, information, and many other sources of uh, 
ability or for our ability to communicate and stay, and stay in networks. So I would say that I would hope, and again, we know from the data has, that has already been collected and been published, that telehealth has significantly improved the ability of providers to give treatment for opioid use disorder and also has helped retain patients in treatment. Yeah, thank you. And I think as you have more data um, from your uh, uh, researchers or your, your agency that comes out about the effects of the um, regulations during the regulation changes during the pandemic, um, those of us out here, the advocates, families, patients, the patient advocacy field, we can take that uh, back to others to change sort of um, more long-term some of those regulations. So uh, perhaps working in partnership with your science and our voices that we can see some of these change um, uh, for the future. Yeah, no, I think it is very important. And I do think we do have an obligation and we cannot lose that obligation. We need to actually view it straight in the face and says, what is it that we need to know? And I think that I take advantage of the, these changes in policies that in the past have made it very hard for patients to access treatment that have now have been relaxed and to use that momentum to make the treatment more accessible. And so we're discussing about how telehealth has made it easier for patients to be prescribed buprenorphine and retaining treatment. But another advantage has been too in terms of the criminal justice system that as a result of the pandemic and the fact that COVID can actually widely spread in prisons and jails, many of the prisons and jails have been very proactive and actually, for example, uh, done policy changes that allow for the people that are in prison to immediately have access to insurance when they leave the prison or the jail. And that allows them to then uh, seek out treatment and be uh, and kept in treatment. It has also released people with no nonviolent offenses into the community. I mean, I, and what I mean, the, the challenge there is we want to do that, but we want to be able to provide support for those people because otherwise anyone will fail. But we need to provide the support. But it's an, again an opportunity to see how this whole criminalization that has been one of the strategies that we have used as a nation to address the substance use disorder is actually so detrimental at so many levels. And, and that's why I say we need to get the data that help us understand how to optimally change these practices in ways that improves outcomes. Um, another question that came in, the pandemic has created a vital opportunity for substance use disorder and mental health service providers to finally become aligned with physical medicine, especially as we prepare um, for the shift to value-based care. However, national guidance on best practices are essentially non-existent. Existent. What are your thoughts on effective integration for the future? Yeah, and um, again, I'm glad for that question. I mean, one of the things that we have always described is how important it is to give treatment access to individuals with substance use disorder. What I like to speak about and says is not just giving them access to treatment, it's giving them access to quality treatment care. Because if actually what we have, we, what we know is that there are a wide variety of treatments that have proliferated as part of the opioid crisis that actually have no evidence base on their intervention and in the long term actually are very deleterious. So, and, 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 and to um, help to, to promote the stigma against the treatments of addiction, because treatments of addictions are also stigmatized, particularly the medications. And so what we are doing also as a science agency is to provide with uh, tools that can be utilized and evaluated with respect to um, how do you, uh, create a, a score for the quality of a, a particular treatment program? How do we create a network that disseminates that information of the scores so that if you are a patient or you're a family member that needs to seek up a treatment, you have access and you, you've actually, your organization has also been working on this to an indicator about how other patients are rating that facility, but also how does that facility um, score when you look at it of what the science and the evidence tells us? And so that can be used as a positive feedback 
for the treatment program to do better, but also it helps patients ultimately to choose. And third, importantly, it advances us to the uh, value-based intervention because, and, and there is a move and Shatterproof for, uh, is one of the organization that has partnered with um, private insurances in that case to actually uh, involve and engage their reimbursement on the basis of the quality of care that the treatment programs are providing. And so all of these steps are actually are building a role that will hopefully facilitate the delivery of um, outcome-based treatments and the reimbursement on, on the basis of good quality care. That's such an uh, important to move in that direction. Um, our approach has been uh, sort of an educated consumer and an educated uh, family and caregiver, the sort of folks that are around the patient and giving better information and understanding that information to know where that quality care is, is such an important game changer. So it's, it's just a critically important item for us to prioritize in our field. Um, I had another question. Um, uh, and the, the, I'm going to paraphrase this one with a few other questions that have come in through the chat box. I know that both you and Dr. Fauci um, have stated rather clearly that um, uh, currently receiving or taking a medication for addiction treatment or medication for opioid use disorder um, does not present an adverse effect for being vaccinated. We have another question that came in. Um, does that include individuals who are on uh, using methadone for treatment of an opioid use disorder? Does that present any challenges to um, uh, or, or side effects in taking the vaccine? Yeah, and I think uh, actually um, Dr. Fauci responded that very well. There is no specific uh, reason why someone that is receiving methadone or is receiving buprenorphine or naltrexone should not be eligible for the vaccine. And his response was, I mean, because of the effects of opioids on um, basically decreasing the reactivity of our immune systems, they may not get as good an immunological response as someone that's not taking drugs but they will still have a better protection than if they don't get vaccinated. So yeah. there is no reason for someone that is on methadone not to receive the vaccination. Right. And that same um, uh, immune suppression could also lead to a um, more severe response to contracting the coronavirus. So it's really making sure that we make this information really clear to our patient population and ensure that they're all vaccinated. Correct. And I think that that's the, the point that we want to highlight because it is individuals with substance use disorder are at greater risk for COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate, but we need to understand it so that we can give them also priority in terms of vaccination. And, um, and again, I think I cannot underemphasize it while also at the same time, I mean, if we look at uh, the groups that are most negatively affected, which are minorities and communities of color, um, they're also the ones where there is, as Tony mentioned, there is more reason to distrust of uh, federal agencies and where we need to partner and be transparent in, in terms of communicating and listening to them um, to gain their trust. Yeah. Because it is, after all, I, I actually cannot sort of stop thinking how extraordinary it is that we have that vaccine, so, so many vaccines, so extraordinary effective in such a short period of time in one of the worst crises that we've ever seen. It's, it's almost like magic. Mm -hmm. And yet the next challenge is the implementation. And, uh, and I, as a scientist, of course, resonate immediately to it. I mean, it just it sort of says, this is so extraordinary. What an amazing opportunity. But those that are outside the science or that have been mistreated, um, that doesn't come automatic. So that's the challenge that we need to bring in, the human factor uh, to address each person where they are in terms of right now and their history and be respectful of that so that we can communicate and gain their trust. So sort of a follow-up question to that, um, and this is a, a three-part question. Um, how many states um, have specifically including, included people with substance use disorders um, in, in the list of pre-existing conditions or in prioritizing vaccination? 
Jessica, you're catching me off guard. I do not know the number of states that have uh, put them as priorities. Um, so I'm sorry, I owe you that answer. Yeah. So I do not know. I actually, I wish I, I, I should know, but I don't. I don't think we found, we haven't found any or are aware of any. So I think the follow-up question to that is if this isn't sort of a pretty consistent pre-existing condition, though we know from uh, what you've written about this and all the science that you're doing in your agency, what role has stigma played in our patient group not being included on that priority list? It is, it plays a role. And I, I mean, actually, when I read newspapers or articles or hear from our uh, grantees that they are, and I was mentioning to you earlier, I mean, I just shocking to hear that some prisons um, or jails refuse to vaccinate the individuals. I mean, that's a prejudice. That's an absolute prejudice because they are at the greatest, highest risk. Of course, in, in other states, they have been prioritized, but in others, no. And, 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 uh, and it also reflects how different policies really have, and they have nothing to do with science at all. They have to do with our own prejudices towards these populations. And unfortunately, they have negatively affected everything. And, and in the case, for example, of individuals with substance use disorder, the stigma um, makes them having being much more, have, having much more frequently a chronic conditions than people that don't have a substance use disorder because I mean, they, they don't go to take care of them. So they let them linger uh, and they become more severe. And that of course increases further the risk of uh, COVID infections and adverse outcomes. So it, it, I mean, the stigma is affecting negatively at multiple levels. Thank you for, sorry for putting, putting you on, on the spot there, but we'll continue to track. And if we find states that, uh, change the list of conditions that are prioritized, we'll be sure to, to share that back with you as well. Um, another sort of question that's come in, we talk about the vulnerabilities of substance use disorder as sort of a pre-existing condition, and you've explained, um, we thank you for breaking that down for us on the effects on um, lungs and heart and blood vessels. Um, for those that are in recovery from a substance use disorder, how long can one anticipate that vulnerability to last? And does that change based on the type of substance use disorder? Or what guidance would you give to individuals um, if you are new into um, recovery? Should you still consider yourself at risk because of your SUD history? If you're five years in recovery or 10 years or 20, um, do these systems repair themselves over time? The, the, the body does have an ability to recover, but it's not infinite. And uh, the level of damage and the chronicity and the severity of drug use, as well as your own genetic vulnerability, will determine how much recovery you have. And importantly, also the new lifestyle that you are able to take. And, and we know, for example, and, and again, it's not just the illicit substances, but even the illicit ones like alcohol profoundly damage your liver and your ability to recover from liver damage uh, is in part dependent, again, the same questions, chronicity, severity of drug taking and genetic factors and your ability to actually be able to lead a life with more healthy behavioral choices. I think that an important message though, I would want to say to all of those that are in the recovery community at different stages of that recovery process is to be very aware that uh, of the enormous amount of stress linked with a COVID pandemic and how that actually jeopardizes the, uh, I mean, the success in, in, in sustaining recovery. And this is, um, again, something that unfortunately we have heard uh, of people that have been in recovery relapsing during the COVID pandemic. And so I, I, that is something that I would like to highlight how we have to be all um, very, very attentive and uh, that these uh, increased risks put everyone, everyone at risk, so more than others including people with, uh, that are on recovery and, uh, and being proactive about it, not, not just sort of being overconfident. And that is crucial. And so uh, as for the recovery of the physiology, again, it's very much dependent of how much damage uh, the drugs have done to the various uh, system, how old you are, and I mean, some people have incredible resilience from 
genes, they can smoke and they never get any pulmonary damage. I mean, so it's very rare, but, but you do have individuals with resilience. And then you have those that have increased sensitivity. We're all very different. Yeah. So it's a combination of factors that can yeah. lead to that risk. Now, you mentioned about sort of the importance of checking in on each other and making sure that the effects of isolation and the stress of the pandemic doesn't have a negative impact on us as a community. Um, there's a, a, a really beautiful written question I'm going to summarize because I know I'm running out of time with you. Um, but as we've been separated from each other, um, uh, how, how can we stay more connected um, uh, when we can't be together? Like what lessons have we learned moving forward on how we cannot be isolated when we are isolating? Yeah, I think that uh, the, the question itself comes around. I mean, be proactive in terms of reaching out to people. I mean, even if, though we cannot see each other, I mean, a phone call, an email, a text, it can do wonders. Um, and, uh, and, and so be proactive in remembering people and uh, saying, I will call this person, I will encourage them. And, and I think that I, I, I sort of actually like to play a game with um, before the pandemic, now we cannot do that because we are all wearing our masks. But I would like to play a game to see uh, who could make more people smile when sort of actually I was with my nephews or nieces and we were walking to the street and we would have a competition about who, who of us will get more people to smile. And, and it's a very simple trick. Just smile at someone else and they smile back at you. Be, be generous, be kind. And I think that that kindness can do enormous amount of good. And, and I think that, um, and that's where I, I've seen it. I mean, certainly that people in supermarkets uh, or in just walking in the street tend to be kinder, tend to be more attentive. I think that those little details uh, can make the difference between having a good day and a bad day and to be hope. Uh, hopeful or to be um, in despair. No, that's very, very good recommendation for all of us. Now, um, do you have any sort of final thoughts or wisdom that you want to share with our community? And we have uh, over 4,000 folks that joined us today for this really important webinar. And we, we really are grateful to you for your time, but parting wisdom and thoughts for our community? Yeah, no, I think, and I welcome the opportunity to speak with so many people because I think that Again, with this introspection that comes with COVID, I mean, more than ever, I mean, the recognizing how we are all really um, linked with one another and how dependent we are with one another and how our well being depends on the well being of someone else and how devastating it is when someone else suffers. And I was actually listening yesterday at the Denver killings and how, how disruptive it is. And I think that if we cannot realize that how important is this human connection and, and that we can do, again, things to make others um, feel better and we can help them. And, and in turn, we help ourselves because it's highly powerful to be able to help someone else and reinforcing. And we can do a society that is much better than the one that we currently have. A society that does not discriminate, that is not racially driven, that does not mistreat people, and that is equitable. I think that that's what we can aim to do, and I think that we can all strive for that and not become cynical. That will be my, 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 part in, my part in words, Jessica, and I really do thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone and uh, for all of the incredible work that you and your organization are doing. Thank you, Dr. Volkoff. I really appreciate it. Um, we, we chatted at the beginning about making sure there's a lot of questions, more than 400 questions have come in, and we could only get to, um, I think I covered 30 of them. So that was a pretty good start. Um, so we will work with your amazing staff um, to try to complete the Q&A and an FAQ to make sure that we're answering all the questions from our community. Jessica and the whole group and everyone out there listening, thanks very much. And until the next time, hopefully in person. All right, that would be great. Thank you, Dr. Volkoff. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, thank you to everyone um, for staying on with us and for joining us today um, and for your amazing questions that you've submitted. Um, 
you know, it was it was a difficult task to uh, start to try to sort through all of these, um, but we will work with NIDA and NIAD to um, uh, try to complete an answer to all questions that were submitted, um, send them back out to everyone who's been in touch with us, as well as putting these together in FAQs that will be available on our website, along with our slide deck and a recording of today's webinar. Um, uh, so very, very grateful for everyone. This was a team effort since our entire community really, um, these were your questions uh, presented to, to uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Volkoff today.